of the previous topic. And that's why all of the faculty are here. So if there are questions from you, um, the presenters would like to answer those questions. And if there's no questions from you because it's all so perfectly clear, then the faculty will have an argument amongst themselves, a symposium in the platonic sense, as to whether what is good and what is bad. So without uh, further ado, we'll begin this morning's session, um, and we are going to try and keep to time. So we're going to begin uh, the first session on... Um, On, on, on the instrumentation and what is important uh, in terms of the instrumentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about ultrasound physics and then we're going to move through from ultrasound physics into uh, two-dimensional echo uh, uh, and then we're going to talk about Doppler and color flow. Then we're going to talk about 3D. We're going to talk about strain and strain rate and failure and we're going to talk about magnetic resonance imaging. So where this echocardiography really began after the Second World War, where um, in actual fact uh, this is the first instrument. This is Dr. Inge Edler and this is Dr. Karl Helmut Hertz. He's the grandson of the, of the famous uh, Nobel laureate. And uh, what they got held is they got a metal tester from a submarine yard in Germany for testing the flaws of metal, which was done with ultrasound. And they modified this uh, to provide on this a uh, little oscilloscope screen that you can't see covered by a Polaroid camera which uh, is handheld at the moment and they produced a, a, a first mode which was called A mode or amplitude mode and um, Dr. Edler saw this and he saw something moving backwards and forwards here and he said that's the pericardium well the gentleman died and uh, so what they did is they took an ice pick here's the ice pick here and after, at autopsy, he plunged it through the heart in the same direction as his ultrasound probe. And he found, in fact, that this echo that was moving backwards and forwards here was really the, um, the A mode amplitude of the mitral valve as it moved backwards and forwards. So this was depth, and, uh, and this was the amplitude, was the height of the signal. And this is the so called ice pick view, and here's the ice pick through uh, that very heart. Now, ultrasound. Um, is um, a base Snell's laws of light because it's a f a, in that frequency. So it can be uh, both transmitted, it can have three things. It can be transmitted, it can be refracted, and it can be reflected. And it's these three um, uh, characteristics that make ultrasound diagnostically valuable. This is a polarized light chamber with some light in it and a single ultrasound beam, okay? So, of course, you can see this little wire here allows transmission of sound and also focus. And uh, certainly lenses of various descriptions have been put onto ultrasound beams uh, to focus the beam. Uh, in addition to the main part of the beam, there are these little lobes which are called grating lobes which occur. And we also know that there is something called time compensated gain, which is very important. We just call it gain these days. But actually, sound attenuates as it's passed through tissue. And so that in order to see the signal, you have to compensate the time for the time that it reflected back to you in a certain direction. And it's a, an exponential type of uh, augmentation that is occurring that is important for uh, cardiac ultrasound. Now, as far as the types of ultrasound are concerned, here is the original uh, uh, probe of Dr. Inga Edler placed uh, diagrammatically through the heart. Here is the A mode. And what uh, the uh, ultrasound does always is it turns the signal on its side and makes a dot whose brightness is proportional to the amplitude. And that's called B mode ultrasound, which is what we use. If you just take a single B mode ultrasound and you run it over a strip like an electrocardiogram, you get a graph of depth versus time which is what M-mode echocardiography is. And then after that, uh, in the development in the 70s and the 80s, people modified vibrating toothbrushes so that they could get two-dimensional scans. And then uh, they decided to make multiple crystal scans. And finally, uh, they decided that they could use an electrical signal light from radar, 
and they could phase the signal so that if you excite the signal in one way, it gets steered uh, in this direction, and if you excite it the other way, it gets steered in the other direction, and if they excite it all the same way, the sound travels. So that by exciting the crystals in a different array, uh, you could get the beam to be steered electronically. And because we use color and um, uh, CW and PW and M mode, uh, and 2D all simultaneously, and even 3D, all of these things are important, and the order of magnitude goes up with each different type of modality. So when you come to MO crystals, it's very simple, okay? 2D is more complicated, and 3D is exponentially more complicated than 2D, because the, the numbers of crystals uh, goes up into the thousands, and each one of them has to be modified. And I'm sure Dr. Shirali will explain some of that to you. Well, when a sound is traveling uh, through um, a beam, it, uh, it makes a, a reflection, and of course gain is important. So if you have your gain right, you get something that looks like this. And that's why in M-mode, certainly, we made leading edge to leading edge measurements, because those numbers never change. Leading edge to leading edge is always the same. Okay. Um, this is very important, the wavelength. You need two wavelengths in order to um, uh, see a distance in depth. And here is an example of what happens if you increase the frequency. Obviously, you increase the number of times and uh, things you can see. Now, as the frequency goes up, the depth of resolution goes down. Um, I think it's uh, something like a millimeter and a half with the 2.5, and it's about 0.3 millimeters depth resolution with a 10 megahertz probe. So it changes as the frequency goes up, the amount of resolution that you can resolve goes down, which is why as many of us, uh, this is the one question I didn't ask. Um, I, I needed to know this, it's very important, maybe the faculty will look. Who is a neonatologist here? Would you please raise your hands? Okay. Who's a pediatric cardiologist? Good. Who's a radiologist? Who's an obstetrician? Who's an anesthesiologist? Okay, well, that's okay. You know what they say about anesthesiology? It's that person that de, um, administers a drug to keep somebody half asleep while they're half awake. But anyway, there are none of them here today, so uh, we all know who we are. Are there other technologists here? Are there anybody that does cardiac uh, ultrasound technology? Okay, so we're basically dealing with pediatric cardiologists and neonatologists. Now, a bean when it's traveling through an ultrasound field, it has um, a certain uh, um, characteristic that is almost unalterable. And that is, as the beam disappears, it's going to diverge. And we make several different aspects to the beam to change it, uh, depending on the size of the, of the beam, the wavelength. The higher the frequency, the quicker the beam diverges which is why pediatric ultrasound is so much more difficult than adult ultrasound because you have to focus that beam and we focus beams on a variety of bases. We focus beams sometimes on um, with what we call an acoustic lens which is a special lens that we put over that acts just like a pair of glasses and then we also use electronic focusing which is much more important because the beam can be focused in two dimensions or three dimensions as opposed to um, what an acoustic lens which will only focus it in one dimension. Okay, and yet the distance, uh, the way it is, and the near field length also subject to mathematical equations, and here are the equations on the board. Now I'm going to just uh, finish stopping here because um, when um, we steer the beam, initially we steered it along something called scan lines. And if you ever saw an old-fashioned ultrasound machine and had these little lines in it and of course the further away you get these lines will diverge on a series of uh, areas and there are many techniques that the ultrasonographers and engineers have done to uh, control this the one is they call dithering where they pretend that there's another signal in between the two and uh, then the other thing is that they can increase the number of scan lines and now for example the old pr probes with the uh, 16 elements as opposed to 512 elements, the amount of scan lines and the density and what we call lateral resolution as opposed to axial resolution was markedly increased. 
Okay, so uh, Steve, I'm going to let you take over and do the three-dimensional, uh, the 2D uh, Doppler study from here on, and I'll come back after Steve has finished to, to talk about Doppler ultrasound. You need the thingy? Yeah. Okay. If that's the way you want to be. Sorry, can I ask you something? Sure. With the turns on the air conditioning, it's really cold. Yes, um, it's cold. You want it off? Yeah. Okay, I'll see what I can do for you. Otherwise, can I give you my jacket? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to check. Not enough. Okay, is that all right? Can everyone hear? Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about generation of two-dimensional images. And originally, as uh, Dr. Silverman explained to you, the way this was accomplished was simply by rotating a single transducer element back and forth uh, and recording multiple scan lines as the transducer was swept back and forth to create uh, a two-dimensional image. So we went from having a, an M-mode image being a single scan line to having multiple scan lines and creating a coherent two-dimensional image. Turns out that this was not uh, probably the ideal way of doing this. And so uh, <clears throat> the next development really was uh, development of array transducers, as uh, Dr. Silverman alluded to. The original array transducers were linear arrays, so they were long transducers that were used mostly for abdominal scanning or other kinds of scanning. They weren't very good for the heart because they were too long to get through intercostal spaces. Uh, so the next idea was to create uh, an array that was smaller that could, in which the beam could be uh, steered uh, from side to side electronically instead of actually uh, moving the transducer. And so these array transducers were created with multiple small elements within the array. So there might be, you know, <clears throat> uh, 32 or 64 or 128 or more elements in the array depending on the year that you're talking about actually. Um, and each of these little elements would create its own wavelet, if you will, uh, and the wavelets then coalesce by uh, constructive and destructive interference to create the beam uh, that emanates from the, the array transducer. And you could steer this uh, electronically by changing or phasing uh, the uh, excitation of each of the little uh, individual crystals, so-called phased array transducers. Uh, and so <clears throat> by changing the, the uh, timing of firing of each of these little transducers, and again based on the physics of wave interactions and constructive and destructive interference, this would steer uh, the beam back and forth and you could then do it in an even more complex fashion to uh, accomplish focusing the beam as well as steering it back and forth and so you get uh, sort of things like this and this is how uh, phased array uh, transducers actually create uh, a focused sound beam for us uh, uh, to use to, to make images. <clears throat> now that's the on the send side but uh, transducers can also function a lot like a camera or like your glasses in that they can also focus, <clears throat> excuse me, on the receive side as ultrasound is coming back as it's reflected uh, from the tissue and is coming back to the transducer. Uh, <clears throat> depending on exactly which elements are active on receiving the returning ultrasound, you can focus the beam uh, as well and you can use, say, uh, a pattern with only a few elements in the middle uh, to receive uh, ultrasound early and then a little bit later uh, during the, the cycle you can uh, activate more elements and receive from more elements and so you get uh, a little bit different beam pattern in the middle and, and later on in the, in the whole uh, 
uh, field of view. <clears throat> and so in this way you can dynamically focus this. So you can change the, the way that it's focusing depending on where in uh, the tissue that ultrasound is coming back from. So not only do you focus the beam as it's being transmitted, but you also focus uh, on receive. And this is a very important uh, aspect of this. This was developed oh, a number of years ago, but this, this and modifications of this are still used today for, uh, uh, for improving the, the quality of images created with ultrasound. So this concept of dynamic uh, receive focusing really is, is very important in how uh, 2D uh, phased array type transducers function. Now remember that this <clears throat> kind of focusing occurs within the uh, long axis of the transducer. Uh, in order to focus uh, in the other dimension, perpendicular to the plane of the image, one has to use, still use a lens. And so an, uh, an acoustic lens is put on the front of the transducer that focuses in the off axis, in the axis perpendicular uh, to the plane of the image. <clears throat> now, how do we talk about the, the quality or the resolving power of uh, an ultrasound device. Well, we, we can talk about two things. One is axial resolution, and by resolution we mean the ability to discriminate as separate two closely spaced structures within the field of view. Uh, so <clears throat> the first one is axial resolution, that is the ability to discriminate uh, along the direction of the ultrasound beam. And that's largely determined by the spatial pulse length. Uh, remember, this is phased, this is uh, pulsed ultrasound. So the transducer is excited for a very brief interval, uh, for microsecond uh, or less. Uh, and because of damping, uh, there's damping material that's in contact with the transducer, and damping is the idea that if you strike a bell and then grasp it with your fingers, it stops the bell from ringing. And the same thing happens here. If you strike the transducer with an electric current uh, and then you have damping material attached to it, it can only ring for a very short period of time. And transducers are critically damped so that they only ring for maybe one or two cycles. Now, during that period of time, the transducer really can't get up to a resonant frequency, so uh, there are a lot of frequencies present uh, within any ultrasound beam. There may be one dominant frequency, but there really are a lot of frequencies present in there. But it's the actual physical pulse length, which is a product of the, the uh, wavelength and the number of cycles that are present in each pulse uh, that determines the axial resolution uh, of the instrument. So the shorter time that it rings, the fewer cycles that the transducer emits, uh, and the shorter the wavelength, the better the axial resolution. So just to give you an idea, Dr. Silverman uh, mentioned these before, uh, if you look at the wavelength of various types of ultra, various frequencies of ultrasound, two and a quarter has a wavelength of about 0.68 millimeters, whereas 10 megahertz has a wavelength of about 0.15 millimeters. So you can see that for any given number of cycles, the spatial pulse length is going to be much shorter for higher frequency ultrasound. So the axial resolution is going to be a lot better. Uh, <clears throat> and in fact, the axial resolution uh, or the separation is about one half of the spatial pulse length. Um, and you can actually figure this out. You can imagine that you have ultrasound traveling out here in your field of view, and you have one reflector here and one reflector here. The separation here has to be at least half of the spatial pulse length, otherwise you'll be getting an overlapping signal from the two. It's only if it's less than half the spatial pulse length will the reflection finish here before ultrasound reflecting from this one reaches the same point in space. And so it has to be at least half the spatial pulse length in order to be resolved. If it's longer than that, you just get a blurred uh, continuation of the same image. So that's the determinant of spatial pulse length, I mean of, of uh, uh, axial resolution. Lateral resolution 
means the ability to discriminate two objects that are side by side in the field of view, uh, that are closely spaced perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. And the main determinant here is the beam width, because the beam actually has to be able to pass between them, otherwise you don't see them as separate, okay? So we want to have a narrow beam width, whoops, in order to have the beam so that there is a point in time when ultrasound is not returning from this particular area. If the beam always overlaps one or the other, then we always see sound energy coming back from this uh, distance from the transducer, and it looks like these two closely spaced objects are actually one. So the determinants then, uh, ooh, the determinants of this, and actually Dr. Silverman had started to talk about this, and that is uh, the ability to focus uh, the ultrasound beam. So what we want is to be able to focus uh, the ultrasound beam to be able to improve our lateral resolution. So image quality in 2D is largely a function of frequency, uh, the width of the transducer face, the number of elements, and the element spacing. Here you can see that the frequency does a couple of things, as we've already seen, that it creates a shorter spatial pulse length, so we have better axial resolution. But the other thing it does, interestingly, is it increases the length of the near field. And one can only focus the beam within the near field. So the longer the near field, the longer the area uh, of good focus that essentially that you can have for the transducer. So frequency does a couple of things. The width of the aperture, the width of the transducer face also determines this because uh, it also, uh, a, sh a larger aperture uh, has a longer near field associated with it. And surprisingly, a, a larger aperture can also be focused to a smaller minimum beam diameter just by the physics of, of um, destructive interference at the edge of the beam. So the, the, the size of the element is important. The number of elements, just like for any digital process, the more steps involved in the process, the better the, the resolution. So this is a digital process. There are individual elements involved here. The more elements, the finer uh, the control over the, uh, the shape of the beam, the focusing, and all of the other uh, aspects, and so uh, the better the overall image quality. And also the spacing of the elements is important in the transducer. Uh, the, the ideal spacing is the wavelength over two, so the, the, the length of the ultrasound uh, that you're transmitting divided by two. Uh, it turns out that at that, the grading lobes that Dr. Silverman talked about before, uh, the angle between the main beam and the grading lobes is, is the greatest uh, when uh, the spacing is at lambda over two. Uh, and so you get <coughs> these extra little uh, things going off into space and not being reflected back to the transducer and creating artifacts within the image. So all of these things are, are very important for uh, 2D quality. This is just an example of a grading lobe artifact. Uh, you can see they occur near the edge of the image uh, and uh, they look uh, like this. And you can imagine if there was a structure here of interest underneath that, you obviously wouldn't be able to see it. So they're, they're actually uh, important. So I'll stop here and Dr. Silverman is going to go back and talk now about uh, Doppler. Thank you, Steve. That was very nice. brief. All right, so then uh, um, in uh, 1955, a gentleman called Satomura started looking at noise that was coming from the inside of blood vessels. And uh, that turned out to be Doppler ultrasound. And uh, the Doppler ultrasound of, that we use today, which looks at the waveforms that comes off bouncing vessels. How about that? Is that better? Is anybody having any trouble hearing me? Okay. There are two kinds. The one is a pulse Doppler, where sometimes the signal transmits a pulse, and then it listens for the return of that signal, okay, on the same transducer. 
Therefore, the amount of frequency that it can see depends on the wavelength of how quickly it can send and receive. And then there's the one called continuous wave Doppler, which is really two transducers, one which is always sending and one which is always re receiving. And this uh, equation was established by Christian Johan Doppler. Um, we actually, he was more interested in planets and whether the universe was red or blue shifted. Uh, but he managed to apply this to a number of uh, different items. And you see here that the frequency is related to two because of the send and receive, the native frequency over the velocity times the cosine of this angle. Obviously, the more acute or the more axial you get, the more the actual resolution of this. And C is the transmission of ultrasound in a various medium. In the body, which is like water, it's between 1,540 and 1,580 meters per second. And there are precise clocks in an ultrasound system that determine that. So here is a picture of old Christian Johann Doppler. And you can see that uh, the, the frequency um, is better actually the lower the frequency is, the higher the range of allowing uh, uh, Doppler to be focused using uh, this particular equation. Now, uh, when we use color, we talk about the Nyquist limit. The Nyquist limit is related to a pulse Doppler system and relates to uh, how many cycles you can see, uh, and um, that will tell you the level of what velocity uh, the sound is perceived where it, um, it, it uh, goes into an alias position. Now what we use Doppler for is uh, quickly um, volume calculations and a volume calculation based on a vessel analogy which is a circle and the time velocity integral which is the distance of blood over a certain or a, anyway, a tracking of one red cell over a period of time and how fast this gives us, which is called the stroke distance. And this allows us to calculate the velocity of blood flow by the cross-sectional area and the mean velocity of flow. And we use this particularly in uh, looking for cardiac output. And here's an example from the neck where we measure the dimension of the vessel. It's a little bit of a weakness in the Doppler signal because we know that there's a 17 to 20 percent variation in the size of a signal uh, of, the, of, the of the vascular cross-sectional area. And then we also have to look at the velocity of flow. And here you see a beautiful example of a normal flow where the uh, downward velocity is less than a quarter of the uh, dispersion of the upstroke velocity. It's not filled in at all. And this is a calculation based on the ascending aorta uh, involving the cosine of the angle here and also in the pulmonary artery uh, as well and so if you uh, do a velocity integral on this you can see that this patient has about a 1.3 to 1 shunt from a ventricular septal defect. So that's very important because we can calculate cardiac output for example, in the nursery, if you want to know what the cardiac output is, we can do regional cardiac outputs and so on and so forth. So we calculate the QPQS based on a, a quick little cartoon that I've got here where we look at the cross-sectional areas and we make a relationship of the ratios. And as the velocity, the radiuses or the diameters are squared, we, if we square the diameter difference between the aorta and the pulmonary artery and multiply that by the mean velocities of the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, we can calculate the pulmonary systemic flow ratio. Always putting the pulmonary artery on the numerator position and the aorta and its velocity on the denominator issue. Now, the difference between pulse wave and continuous wave is beautifully defined in this example from, um, from Dr. Bill Berman from his book on cardiology, and that is that um, pulse Doppler is a range specific and continuous wave Doppler, because it doesn't have to uh, rely on a, a, a pulse signal, is frequency specific, but range ambiguous. So you have a choice of either frequency or range specificity, whether you use a pulse wave Doppler or a continuous wave Doppler ultrasound. Now, there was a family called Bernoulli's. There were several of them. Uh, they were Swiss um, um, physicists. And uh, this Daniel Bernoulli, who lived between 1700 and 1782, 
define this equation has become very important for us for calculating um, um, uh, pressure drops. And it says that the pressure between the two is equal to half of the density times the velocity distally minus the velocity proximally, which is called convective acceleration, and add to it the integral of the density and, and the velocity with respect to time and space, which is flow acceleration, which we use for looking at mitral uh, decelerations, and the viscous friction formula, which is part of um, the Reynolds number. Uh, which uh, um, all looks very beautiful in terms of a mathematical equation, but being sort of pragmatic people, we just uh, uh, take this equation here and simplify it that the change in pressure is equal to 4 times the distal velocity squared. Where do we get that? Rho here is 1.06 divided by 9.81 grams per second squared to centimeter squared, multiplied by 1 over 1.36 to convert to 9 centimeters per second, multiplied by a half, and that works out to 3.972, which is roughly 4. And is V1 is usually less than 1, and you square a number that's less than 1, you get a number much less than that. So you can disregard that equation. Uh, of course, when you have to take this into account, if it's faster, then you really do need to know what the proximal and distal velocities are. The other thing that we use is the continuity equation for measuring valve areas. It's not so important in pediatrics because we don't uh, make measurements on valve areas. And this one is based on the fact that if there's a structure going in, and, it's, and uh, to a particular, and all of the flow goes through there, and that's continuous, and it comes out at that velocity, then the proximal and distal areas times the velocities are going to be a constant. So that allows us to calculate the valve area. We'll get to that in a minute. Pressure drops. Now, there's several differences why when we calculate a pressure drop and our colleagues go to the cath lab, they find a difference and the differences are numerous. The first is if you look at this curve down here, which is a real curve of pressure and volume, the catheterizers take this peak velocity, which is temporarily different. Doppler only reads something that is temporarily the same, and as you can see, the pressure drop at the time of peak velocity is much higher, and they're one of the reasons why we get a differential is related to the fact that Doppler can't do what the catheterizers can do with their eye. Um, in order to obviate that, if you take and integrate the uh, velocity over this and you get a mean velocity, that uh, appears to be a much more accurate reflection of what pressure drop is across various valves. Now, in addition to that, there's something called pressure recovery time, which is uh, when you look at uh, something that occurs in the jet there, obviously with the the um, profound uh, um, uh, velocity changes that occur in a jet, there's a change in pressure, and that's called the, um, the pressure recovery time. So if you take a pressure right close to a jet, it's lower, and if you withdraw the catheter further away from the pressure drop, the pressure seems to recover. And Dr. Rick Humes and his colleagues did a series and showed that the um, relationship of pressure recovery, if you take that into account, and it's really a very incredibly complicated um, um, formula. It's pr pretty much um, close to the line of identity, but that if you take the mean velocity, it's so little different and so easy to do that we'd rather use mean velocity changes, as I described uh, back here, to calculate the real pressure drop across an aortic valve, for example. So here we can look at the severity of uh, pulmonary stenosis, and you can see here a, a valve which is obviously restrictive in its character, and we see the velocity coming across the valve, and we can measure the peak velocity, or we can measure the mean velocity and come up with a pressure drop that is consistent with uh, a cl and clinically useful uh, measure of the amount of stenosis that occurs across valves. You can do that, for example, in a patent ductus, which we'll be talking about a little later. And here, the pressures across the, um, the ductus are equivalent to the differences of the systolic and diastolic pressures in the aorta and the systolic and diastolic 
pressures in the pulmonary artery. In addition, if we use pulse wave, we can see the retrograde flow that sometimes occur when the ductus is very large from a bidirectional shunt across the ductus. That's prograde flow across the ductus and retrograde flow. Prograde and retrograde flow. Now this is also branched out into the area of, um, of, um, of function. I don't know, Mark, are you talking about this? Okay, so I'm going to just leave that for Mark to talk about. Oh, all right. Well, this is the basis of the, the Tay Index, was described by Chua Tay, who worked at the Mayo Clinic and um, was, uh, has broken down the cardiac cycle into a number of the various parts of the cardiac cycle. So, for example, uh, this um, area here is um, uh, the ejection time, and this is the isovolumic contraction time and the isovolumic relaxation time, and they've made a ratio of these two indexes, one which is a systolic index and one which is really a diastolic index over an ejection time. And this has uh, become um, apparently so valuable that there have been over a thousand papers published in the literature using this information. Um, it is said that this is really related to the functional aspect of, 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 of flow, but it really isn't. Um, it's uh, probably related to loading conditions that cause the changes. And of course, you can measure it by M mode as well by looking at the ejection time here and the time between mitral opening and closing, which is the Doppler on a different circulation. And we have uh, produced the same factors. Now, I'd just like to finish about talking about color flow. Um, when you deal with color flow, you have four variables that are unalterable in their dimensions. There's scan line density, frame density, frequency resolution, and depth and width of the scan. And by changing any one of these, you can highlight and augment the changes any other way. We always look at this little Nyquist limit or the bar that tells us velocity, and that's the way we represent it, but it really is best represented as a circle as it goes round and round and round. And when it goes round more than once, we call that aliasing. Now, let's just look at what changing the frequency will do for the Nyquist limit. And here you can see um, with the Nyquist limit held constant, if you take map changes, which we are, have on our machines, you can change many things about the jet um, uh, characteristics. Here's a patient with tricuspid regurgitation with the same picture, just with four different maps. And you can see that it really does make a difference what kind of mapping you use. Now, PISA is uh, very important because it also allows us the calculation of flow. And you can see here the uh, velocity at the boundary of the first aliasing, which tells us exactly this velocity of the Nyquist limit, which is 17 centimeters per second here. And all of this blood on this side is accelerating at a line called an isovelocity line, which is where the IS comes from, isovelocity, surface acceleration. And this allows us to calculate flow based on this calculation. Flow is equal to 2 pi r squared times the Nyquist limit, because this is a hemisphere, the area of a hemisphere, multiplied by 60 to mil bring it to mils per minute. And if you want to divide it to bring it to system international or liters, you have to divide by 1,000. When you look at, um, at uh, changing the velocities, you can change the size of the PISA jet simply by changing this. And of course, that is as you change the one, so the jet gets larger and larger. You can see from a small jet here, as we go from 61 to 39 to 23 to 17, the acceleration uh, boundary increases substantially. So it's important to know that. Of course, it's easier to measure big numbers than smaller numbers, so it's very important to know that information. And here again is the boundary of the first alias, which is over here. The second alias is over there, but the distance is easier to measure than this little distance. So you just have to remember where your Nyquist limit is and what you're doing there. I'm going to skip through that. I just want to finish off with this here to say that um, in the, in the um, field of looking at flow characteristics, um, there are many things, one of which is the Coanda effect. And if you put a plate in a jet in a, in a water bath, uh, the, the jet will accentuate 
onto the water bath and change its dimension from the ideal jet, which looks something like an ice cream cone, uh, to something that looks flat and abnormal. And of course, that changes also the, the depth and the width of the curve, as you can see here. So um, it's very important to know that. And here is an example of what a free jet looks like. And what happens when you put a plate in, instead of it being the same in both dimensions, it changes its dimension. So that's very important, because when you're not dealing with a free jet, one that's adhering to the wall, it changes its dimension. And so you can change how big you think the regurgitant jet or the, 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 the systolic jet is. The other thing that's important is that the pressure in the receiving chamber changes. And this is work from David Sahn, where he changed the pressure in the receiving chamber from 57 to 8. And you see that the jet actually increases in size. So if you're seeing mitral and tricuspid regurgitant jets, and they look the same, the regurgitant jet in the mitral valve is going to be more severe because left atrial pressure is higher than right atrial pressure. Very important uh, to know that information. So that's all I want to uh, move on and now talk about three-dimensional ultrasound with Dr. Shirani and then Dr. Hasbani has got a, a lot to say about this area as well. 